we're going to begin with prayer. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at some of the hymns that we have in our hymnal related to the Lord's Supper. When I teach the doctrine of the Lord's Supper to the kids, I, I give them some resources that they can use in preparation for the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to give you guys a test. So what are some resources that you can use as communicants in preparation for the Lord's Supper? Okay, catechism, a particular section. So the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. But there's also another section in the catechism that would be helpful or beneficial. The Christian questions. So we usually associate the Christian questions that Luther came up with that are usually at the front of the catechism along with the Enchiridion, the parts that he wrote with the explanations. There's 20-some questions that we can review and ask ourselves. And I, I go through and I give, there's 20, I think 22 or 23 questions. I have the kids get four of them. We talked about those four questions. Am I a sinner? Am I sorry for my sin? Do I believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins that he died to take my sins away? And do I believe that Christ's body and blood are present with the bread and the wine? So that's four of the questions that Luther gives us in his Christian questions. But there's some others there that can also be helpful in preparation for the Lord's Supper. What else might you use in preparation for the Lord's Supper? Page 118. Okay, so there's two prayers on page 118 in the front of the hymnal. There's a prayer before communion, a prayer after communion. So that's a good place to turn to. Is that what you were going to say, Kayla? Okay, anything else? Two little prayers right at the beginning of the hymnal. Okay, so at the very beginning, you have something also. So I like in our bulletin, I usually, so every once in a while I forget, but usually I have an, a page insert that has some reminders, a review of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, usually I will have a little box in there that will have one of the penitential psalms listed. So there are seven penitential psalms that you can use. Some of you have some of these memorized. Like I know that Emily loves, Emily, what's your favorite psalm? Pardon? What's your favorite psalm? My favorite Psalm 130. Psalm 130, uh, which is one of the penitential psalms. It's the shortest of the penitential psalms, but it's a nice one to review in preparation for the Lord's Supper. And then I like to direct the kids to the hymns in the hymnal from hymn 304, which is the first in the communion section, all the way to 316. And then starting at 317 and going into the 320s, there's a confession and absolution section. And there's actually a hymn that is based on Psalm 130, as well as a couple of the other penitential psalms in the confession and absolution section of the hymnal. So I'll tell the kids, if, if you forget your Bible and you don't have... You can't go up to, well, you might have it in your head too, that's true. Uh, if you don't have that psalm that you can go to and say, okay, I can't, I can't do that. Well, the psalms are in the front of the hymnal. Not all of the penitential psalms are there, but a number of them are. In addition to that, you have the prayers in the front of the hymnal. There are the hymns in the hymnal, the confession and absolution section in the hymnal. There's the section in the bulletin. Usually in the track rack, you can find the Christian questions of Martin Luther or some other track that is uh, something geared to helping you prepare for the Lord's Supper. So this morning, I'm going to use one of those hymns from the Confession and Absolution section of the hymnal as our opening prayer. We pray. With broken heart and contrite sigh, a trembling sinner, Lord, I cry. Thy pardoning grace is rich and free. O God, be merciful to me. I smite upon my troubled breast with deep and conscious guilt oppressed. Christ and his cross, my only plea. O God, be merciful to me. Far off I stand with tearful eyes, nor dare uplift them to the skies. But thou dost all my anguish see. O God, be merciful to me. Nor alms nor deeds that I have done can for a single sin atone. To Calvary alone I flee. O God, be merciful to me. And, and when redeemed from sin and hell, with all the ransomed throng I dwell, my raptured song shall ever be, God has been merciful to me. Amen. <laughs> 
So anybody know what the scriptural foundation for that hymn would be? Oh. I can't remember. The Pharisee and the publican? Uh, where the, the Pharisee beat his breast in the corner with his head bowed below and said, Oh God, be merciful to me. Whereas the Pharisee was saying, Ah, oh, look at how great I am. Thank you, God, for not making me like that individual, the publican. So a nice, a nice Bible story or parable that Jesus tells in order to kind of illustrate the idea of our brokenness, our sin, and what we deserve, but the grace and the mercy of God. All right, we are on the last page in uh, this uh, the, the third pamphlet, and we've been working our way through affirmative and negative theses. So we talked to begin with, this is in the formula of Concord, the largest of the Lutheran confessions, possibly also the most unfamiliar of all of the Lutheran confessions, but it's the most thorough in connection with the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. So they're looking back on this, this was written in 1577 much later than the other Lutheran confessions by almost a generation. And they're looking back on the history of Lutheranism and seeing, okay, we've got some issues that have developed. There's some things that we see are going on, some differences with the Catholics, some differences with some other Reformed individuals that at first looked like they might have been on the side of the Lutherans, but they realize there's this ever-deepening gap between not just the Lutherans and the Catholics, but the Lutherans and this other group. We've been practicing the names of this, this other group. What are they? Two, two different names? Sacramentarians. The Sacramentarians and the funnest name of all? Calvinists. The Crypto-Calvinists. Good. All right, so those, are, those two terms, they, they're, they're describing the same group of people, the Anabaptists. Uh, do you guys remember what the name of the fellow who started the Crypto-Calvinists? Was? Yes, very good. Ulrich, Ulrich you, you got to roll your R's. Ulrich Zwingli was the kind of the forefather of all of this. And then when he died, so he was, he was at the generation of Luther. But then the guy that followed Ulrich Zwingli was John Calvin. And that's where we get Calvinism and crypto-Calvinism comes from. Uh, John Calvin. And remember early on when we started this study, we talked about a little bit of the history that Luther dies, Zwingli dies. Who takes the place of Martin Luther in Lutheranism? Who's the next main fellow? He was Luther's sidekick, but younger than he was. Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon was the kind of, he, he inherited, now he was a we, we call him the Schwaffler. He couldn't make up his mind. He was the one who redid the Lutheran confessions because he wanted everybody to get along. And so he didn't want to stand firm on particular issues. So he rewrote the Lutheran confessions. And that was actually, when he rewrote it, John Calvin actually signed his name to it. He said, I can agree with this. I can't agree with your other one, but I can agree with this one. So Philip Melanchthon and John Calvin, who was the descendant, so to speak, of Ulrich Zwingli, this next generation, those two guys got together and they said, hey, let's compromise. But by compromising, this wasn't a good thing. It was actually a really bad thing because what had happened is they had lost the truth of what God had said about the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. And so a lot of the things that we've been talking about on the surface, it sounds good, doesn't it? It sounds like, yeah, I could accept this. And that was part of what was going on in Lutheranism. The Lutherans, the Lutherans were saying, this sounds good. This sounds like what we teach. John Calvin would say, yes, Christ is present in the sacrament. But he used a qualifier. What was his qualifier? Jesus is spiritually present in the sacrament. So he's not, and, and if he was pressed on it, he would say, no, I don't believe that Christ is physically or in any supernatural way present. It's just that we, we receive him by faith. So there's something very, very different about what the crypto-Calvinists or the sacramentarians were teaching about the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. So we've been reviewing some of the negative theses. We started off with the Roman Catholics. 
What's the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church on the Lord's Supper called? Transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. So in the, the Catholic view... The kids have been on my markers. <laughs> this is true. This is true. It might have been. All right. So the Roman Catholics... The view is transubstantiation. Almost as long as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, but not quite. Transubstantiation. So we break this down. Uh, very simple words. This is, this is a, when I go to catechism class, the kids are like, I can't pronounce that. I said, sure, every big word is made up of a bunch of what? Little words. Little words. Okay, you, you, you've heard this before. Trans means what? Not. Trans change. Change. Yeah, transform, transport. It's a change in location. So trans means change. The next word that you find in here is substance. So a change in the, the form or the substance of something. And then you get this fancy T-I-O-N at the end, which simply means that it's an action. So literally the word transubstantiation means the action of the form or the substance being changed. It's really easy. Big word, seemingly complicated, but it's pretty simple when you break it all down. So in the Roman Catholic view, what are the earthly elements? Bread and wine. Okay, so let's be a little bit more specific. We want to be more specific in this case. This is as bad as my catechism class. One of the kids whispering to one of the other kids what the answer is. Unleavened bread. And? Let's be a little more specific. Red wine. Grape wine. Grape wine. All right, so we have two. Now, this is important because we've already seen, because the Reformed don't respect the sacrament, that they change the earthly elements. They'll remove unleavened bread and they'll replace it with leavened bread. They replace the wine and they will put juice in there. Okay, so now we're talking about the Catholics, though. The Catholics have a respect for the Lord's Supper. So they are going to use unleavened bread and grape wine. So those are the earthly elements. In the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, though, when the priest goes through the words of consecration, uses the words of institution, the unleavened bread, there's an action of the form or the substance being changed, and what does the unleavened bread become? The grape wine goes through a process, an action of the form being changed into what? Okay. Now, from a Roman Catholic view, because of the doctrine of transubstantiation, what a communicant is receiving when he or she goes to the Lord's Supper is what? Yeah, no, not this, but only this. So the communicant is only receiving Christ's body and blood. There is no bread and wine left. The substance has been changed. There is no more bread. There is no more wine. It is the body and the blood of Christ. This is why in the Roman Catholic Church, when you go to visit a church, they will adore the host because it is Christ's body that is there on the altar. This is Christ. And so they... They won't use the word worship. It's called the adoration of the host, but they are adoring what is there on the altar. Now, again, that's why they have a respect for what's taking place, because they view this as Christ's body and his blood. Now, the Reformed, the Reformed are different. 
Now, I, I've always used the term the Reformed. You have to be careful with all of these terms. You could, you could use the word Protestant, but Lutherans are included in Protestants depending on how you break down those terms. So by Reformed, we mean everybody who's not Catholic in their theology and not Lutheran in their theology. So it's all of the rest of these other churches, non-denominational churches, Baptist churches. Uh, those are all going to fall into the Reformed category. What is the word that we use to describe the Reformed doctrine of the Lord's Supper? Representation. Representation. And once again, it's a big word, but we have a pretty simple breakdown. Represent is inside the word representation. So we also use another word. What would be a, another word that would be sort of a synonym to representation, describing what's taking place in the theology? Representing. What's that? I said it's representing. Right, it's representing. Sometimes they will use the word, it symbolizes. So to, to symbolize, it's a symbol. It, it, it represents. It's not real. It's just something that takes the place of. So in the Reformed view, we go back to the earthly elements. What are the earthly elements in the Reformed view? Bread and wine. Okay, now we're going to use just bread and wine because you're right. In this case, it can be any kind of bread. They, they might use unleavened bread, but they might use leavened bread. We're not sure. What about the other? So you said wine. Juice. Yeah, so we might say uh, juice slash wine, depending on, again, the church. That's going to vary quite a bit. Here, we had an action that changes the substance. Here, we have a symbol, a representation. So from a Reformed perspective, when a communicant comes to the Lord's Supper, from their perspective, from their view, what does a communicant receive? Bread and juice. Bread and juice. That's it. Nothing more. So you can see the opposites between these two views, the sacramentarians on one side, the Catholics on the other side. I used to cut the bread up into little cubes and communicant. <laughs> Just, you know, take the extent that the Catholic Church actually did believe, or should, I mean, obviously still believes that the once it consecrated it, it is the blood of Christ. So only the priests would actually drink the wine at one time. Wasn't that correct? Correct. So there's an interesting story on that. And so I've been reading a lot of older documents on the Lord's Supper since we started this whole thing. And we had some questions about, well, you know, how did that happen and why did that happen? And part of it, they, they went back and forth. So in the 1400s, uh, so just about 100 years before the time of Martin Luther, very few people were taking the sacrament. And so the Catholic Church said, hey, we're concerned about this. They ought to be taking the Lord's Supper more often. So they mandated that Catholics take the Lord's Supper four times a year. So they made it a requirement. You have to take the Lord's Supper four times a year. And then there were certain days when, when this would be a big thing. So on some of those days... Since they were only, it was only available or people were only required to take it on really big festivals like Easter or Christmas or things like that, there were, over the years, what would happen is that they only got to the point where they were taking the Lord's Supper four times. It was only being offered on a, on a smaller, uh, less often basis. And so what would happen, and think about it, this is Catholicism. This is before the Reformation. That means everybody's Catholic. And so on Easter Sunday... Everybody comes to church to receive the Lord's Supper. And in these big areas where there's only one church, you had 2,000 Catholics that are coming to church and they want to receive the Lord's Supper. And guess what happens? Ran out. No, the worship service is like four hours long. And they said, well, we can't have that. We've got to find a way to speed up the process. And so as a result of that, they said, well, we'll speed up the process by, by not giving the communicants the wine. So that was one of the logical reasons for why, at that time, leading up to the time of Martin Luther, the cup was withheld from the, the laity. The whole process was to speed it up 
to make sure that on these Sundays when they were actually going to have the Lord's Supper, they could get done with it more quickly. Now, part of it, we've all also talked about the fact that they didn't want this in Luther's mind. It was because what was in the chalice was the, the blood of Christ and there was the danger of spilling his blood. So that was part of it also, at least in Luther's mind. But that was a, that was a hundred years later. So for a generation leading up to the time of the Reformation, there were, there were none within Catholicism that had received Christ's blood in the Lord's Supper. Can you imagine that? For a whole generation leading up to the Reformation, no communicant outside of the priest had received Christ's blood in the sacrament. What happens to people like that? I mean, you and I are covered. You know, we're doing the best we can. But these people were deprived of it. Right. Are they held responsible by Christ? Well, well, certainly the scriptures speak about those who are in authority and doing those things that are contrary will be, they'll have to answer for the things that they do, right? So whether they knew, again, I think we want to put the best construction on people, even those of other religious groups. We don't want to say, well, they did this intentionally because they were trying to keep it back from us. I think they, they honestly were doing what they thought was the best thing but not realizing what the consequences were. But if you remove part of the sacrament, you don't have the sacrament. Just like down here, if you remove part of the sacrament and you change it to leavened bread or juice, it brings into question, is this really, is this really the sacrament if we are not doing it the way that Christ instituted it? So over the, the last 600 years then, the church has kind of gone back and forth on that. And the current practice, from my understanding, is that they leave it up to each individual uh, bishopric to make that decision as to whether or not they're going to make the, the wine available to the laity or not. So the last, it's been several years since I've been up to the Catholic Church here, uh, since before COVID, but at that time, they did not offer the cup to the laity. So I don't know, they've got a new, yeah, new, uh, priest in, in, in so I don't know what they're doing now I haven't they just, heard they just use the bread they just so they still they still do this okay so how, how confusing if you move from sleep you have Minneapolis and you go to a Catholic church and they don't or they do right and I think that's part of our world today where we, we want to be as um Flexible isn't quite the word, but understanding is possible when it comes to other people. And so, but you're right. What happens then is by being flexible, it does create a little bit of frustration. So, and, and just uncertainty with people. What should I do? What shouldn't I do? As opposed to the consistent. We've talked about that a little bit, even with the hymnal. When, when... Well, almost all of us were, were younger. We used this hymnal. And everybody used either page 5 or page 15. And it didn't matter what church you went to. It was going to be the exact same liturgy. With a few exceptions, sometimes the church would leave out the gradual. Or they'd replace the glory and excelsis with the hymn 237. Uh, little, little things like that. But basically, it was the same liturgy. And today now, we look at it even within our own church body. And there's a lot of diversity and not everybody uses the same liturgy we have we have the worship supplement which we use here but and there's a lot of churches that use the worship supplement liturgy but there's some that use liturgies from the new Missouri Synod hymnal so there's even within our own circles some of those same things not to the same degree as the sacrament of the Lord's Supper but there's a there's a lot more variety within churches today because I think that's just the way that our culture is today. It says we like variety. We want to have a... Nobody can tell me what I have to do. There's a little bit of that in all of it today. All right, so any, any questions on our review here? All right, so we are on the last three points on the back page, 19, 20, 21. Uh, the three negative theses on the back. So number 19, a volunteer. That the external visible elements of the bread and wine should be adored in the Holy Sacrament. Okay, who is the, uh, the butt of that 
particular point. Who are they pointing to? Catholics. The Roman Catholics. So they're coming back to the Catholics again, and they're saying because they view that this has changed in its substance, it is no longer bread and it's no longer wine, but it is Christ's body, it is His blood, it should be adored. So they pull that out and they say, hey, no, that is not proper. The, what's the, uh, the doc? We've talked about transubstantiation and representation. What is the name for the one that we as Lutherans hold? To? The real presence. So in the real presence, it is still bread, but it is also Christ's body. It is still grape wine, but it is also Christ's blood. So Luther's way of explaining this was that we believe that Christ's body and blood are present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. So both of those things are present. And since it is still bread, yes, it is Christ's body. We receive that in a way that we can't explain, but we don't adore it. Nowhere in Scripture does the Bible tell us that we should adore this, that, that's correct. That's correct. So the adoration of the host is what is expressed in number 19. How about number 20, Dave? Likewise, we consign also to the judgment of God all presumptuous, frivolous, blasphemous, blasphemous questions, which decent, decency. Which decency forbids to mention and other expressions which most blasphemy, blasphemy, yeah. blasphemous. <laughs> there you go, blasphemously. That's a tough one. And with great offense to the church are proposed by the sacramentarians in gross carnal, capernaumic way concerning the supernatural and heavenly mysteries of this sacrament. Okay, that one's a mouthful. Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah, Kayla's like, thank you for not letting me read that one. So, what group is this one dealing with? There's a couple of hints. Yeah, so that would be the Reformed. So it's look, Now we've gone from the Catholic view in 19 to the Reformed in verse 20. And notice what they're saying. They're, they're, they're condemning a couple of... Now, some of this is just kind of nebulous. They're not getting into details. They said, we're not even going to talk about some of the things that they believe regarding the sacrament. But they mention one. So since the Reformed believed in representation, that it was only bread and either juice or wine... When they looked at the Roman Catholics, and even the Lutherans to some degree, who believed that Christ's body and blood were present in the sacrament. Now, the Catholics said it, it is entirely Christ's body and blood. But the Lutherans, too, said that it is Christ's body and blood, along with the bread and the wine. The Reformed said, well, that's cannibalistic. So, the, they have the word Capernaitic in there. And that was a word that was used that said, well, you're eating the flesh of another human being. So we might use the term cannibalistic. That's a more familiar term for us today. But that's what they're saying. And, and, and what, what the reformers are saying is that whether we... I had this conversation with a, a kid in catechism class one time. It's amazing the conversations that you'll have in catechism class with kids from time to time. But, but they talked a little bit about, you know, eating the flesh of another human being. And we take a look at that today and we say, well, you know, that's just, that's not a, that's not a good thing. And I said, well, there's a little bit of a difference between a dead human being and a live human being, right? So there are plenty of cultures throughout the history that have had rituals where they actually eat the flesh of live human beings. Well, that's, that's something different altogether. But then you have examples of, how many of you are familiar with the Donner Party, the story of the Donner Party? Okay, so the Donner Party, they get caught in the storm trying to get over the mountains into uh, California and a bunch of the individuals die. They're starving to death because they have no way to get food and some of them actually, when people would die, they would eat the, the body in order to stay alive. Now we look at that in our culture and we say, well, that's just disgusting. I wouldn't do that. If well, and that's part of it, isn't it? It's, it's completely different for me to say, well, I've got a full stomach this morning. No way would I ever eat another human being. 
but it would be another if we were starving to death. And, and so part of that is cultural, the way that we look at it. Part of that is what's going on here too, is that they're viewing this from that perspective of saying, we can't eat another human being. But they're, they're looking at it from a more Catholic perspective as opposed to, yes, it is Christ's body and blood, but he tells us this is what we're supposed to do. He says, eat my body, drink my blood, along with the bread and the wine. Yeah. I was just going to say that we have been told by God right. that this is what we should do. Right. And if he, if he tells us to do it, we know what's right. Correct. Right. And, and we can't understand how this can be. But it's there. Right, it is. And, and not, in a, not in any kind of a negative sense either. Yeah. This is something that, as we've talked about, this is something that he does for us for our good. Yeah. This is something that he desires for us to be a blessing for us. And so, but there were those in that culture that said, well, this, this is disgusting, this is wrong. The way that they view, it's revolting, that's a good word. Because they said, no, it's not Christ's body and blood. It is just the earthly forms that we use. It cannot possibly be that because that would be wrong. So again, we're using our reason in order to determine what doctrine is as opposed to starting with the words of scripture and saying, this is what Jesus actually tells us this is what he says, this is what he wants us to do. So God has blessed us with the kind of faith that will accept what he says here. Right. You know, and, and it's that way to all of, all of our lives with, with the church. It, it's a blessing from God when we can understand what he's talking about. Right. Think about the hymn that we often sing, oh, for a faith that will not shrink. Yes. You know, that's what we're praying for, isn't it? That we, that we say, Lord, I, I don't understand how it can possibly be your body and blood because we struggle with the same things that Ulrich Zwingli did and said, hey, he's physically up in heaven. How can he possibly be giving himself to us through the sacrament? But we say, Lord, help me, help me to believe what you have said and not to question those truths that you have revealed to us. Any other thoughts on number 20? Oh, I different than what I was raised with. That was so empty. Mm-hmm. Probably that they have a little mysteries part of it. You know, if we're not going to believe this part, then we might as well not believe in you know, Genesis 1. And right. not believe in Jesus Christ and, and a God and just go back to what our mental capabilities right. tell us we want to believe. And that's the... Ultimately, when it comes to <laughs> differences in the Bible, that's what it boils down to. So, here, I'll, I'll just, I'll try to, re, I'll try not to move from right here. <laughs> there you go. Think, think about all of the examples that we have, though. Almost any doctrinal error that we have stems ultimately from the fact that we don't believe that God's word is authoritative. And so if God's word is not authoritative and something else is our authority, then we have the ability to change whatever we want or to reject whatever we want. And it's a logical, I actually enjoy having that logical argument with a person when they, when they start to bring these things up. Well, you know, you can't have, you can't believe that. I, and I'll tell them, where do you go? If, if you don't believe that God's word is authoritative, which is what it seems like you're telling me based on our conversation here, then how do you determine what part of God's word is true and what part of God's word isn't? How can you trust any of it if all of a, all of a sudden we become the ones who determine what is truth and what is not truth in God's word. And they don't have an answer for that because a lot of times they're just, they're accepting what they want to accept and they don't realize that ultimately by accepting what they want to accept, they've become the authority as opposed to God. So helping them to, you know, point, it, point that out to them I think is helpful. Well, now society's handpicked what sins they want to hold on to basically. Right. And yeah, those things that are, whether it be culturally accepted or personally accepted, again, it's either the culture that becomes the authority or it's me personally that becomes the authority. There's all, that's the question. Who's your authority? That's the question that we want to come back to. Is it God or are you your own authority? You get to determine what is true, what is right, what is wrong, etc. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay, number 21. Uh, I think this one's easier, Dave. 
Hence, <clears throat> hence we hereby utterly reject and condemn the Capernaumic eating of the body of Christ, as though we taught that his flesh we rent with the teeth and digested like other food, which the sacramentarians, against the testimony of their conscience, after all frequent protests, willfully forced upon us, and this way make our doctrine odious to their ears. And on the other hand, we maintain and believe, according to the simple words of the testament of Christ, the true yet supernatural eating of the body of Christ is all and as also the drinking of his blood, which human senses and reasons do not comprehend. But as in all other articles of faith, our reason is brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and this mystery is not apprehended, apprehended otherwise than by faith alone and revealed in the Word alone. So this sounds like Emily. <laughs> uh, th this, this is a nice summary of building on number 20, but a nice summary of what we've been talking about. If we, if we put Scripture as subservient to our reason, then we have a different authority, don't we? Our reason has become the authority. And, and so he brings the same thing up again. So he talks a little bit in the first part of this paragraph about the Copernicanic idea. Now, I'm going to back up just a little bit. This is written in 1577, the formula of Concord. But let's back up 1,500 years. Let's back up to the very early New Testament Christian church. What was the, what was the ruling power at that time? The, the, the Romans. Okay, so the Romans were in charge. Uh, they were under Roman authority, and that, that lasted for a good couple of hundred years after the time of Jesus. And we know from church history how many problems there were between the Christians and the Romans. There's all kinds of letters that have been recorded about, uh, maybe you've heard the, the letter of Pliny the Elder. So he was a ruler in a particular city and Christians were growing in popularity. And so he writes to the emperor and he says, what am I supposed to do with these Christians? He said, they're pretty good people. They're very respectful, but they have these strange customs. And one of the customs that they talked a lot about from a Roman perspective, 1500 years earlier. Now keep in mind that in the early days, the Christians, because Christianity was illegal. So you've heard the stories about them going down and worshiping in the catacombs, right? Underground. So the stories then were mul being multiplied in Roman circles that the Christians were cannibalistic. They heard stories about the Lord's Supper, that they were eating the flesh and, the, and drinking the blood of this person who had lived and died and rose again. So imagine this from a non-Christian perspective. That sounds just a little bit, what was the word that you used earlier, Emily? Um, you had, you, no, no, no. Uh, it, it's revolting. just revolting. There we go. Uh, disgusting. You know, all of these things are going through our heads when we think about what is going on. So what's, what's being recorded here, 1,500 years later wasn't new, but they were drawing back on what the, the, the Romans, the way that they had looked about at the, the doctrine of the Lord's Supper in the early years without understanding what it actually was. But that was one of the problems with the Christians in those early years is that the Romans were looking at, now they had plenty of, it, it's, there's a little bit of an irony that the Romans looked at the Christians and said that they had some uh, revolting customs because the Romans had some really revolting customs. I mean, that's, that's like calling the, the pot, calling the kettle black, right? So this is something though that, again, we have to understand the word that's used in both of these two paragraphs is the one that, that Mark mentioned earlier. It's a mystery. We cannot completely understand it or comprehend it but that doesn't mean that because we can't comprehend it or understand it that we throw it out and say, well, it's not true. Christ's body and blood is present in, with, and under the bread and the wine. It is not a cannibalistic or Copernicanistic eating of Christ's body and blood. 
but Christ tells us that it is present there with the bread and the wine. So they're trying to defend what the scriptural presentation of the Lord's Supper is, what we call the real presence. So Christ's body and blood that is truly present along with the unleavened bread and the wine. Both of those things are present. And for that reason, that's, that's why Christ warns about the danger of partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Because he says you will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. He says you will, you will receive judgment to yourself rather than blessing because it's not just bread and wine. It's more than that. It is also Christ's body and blood. And so, again, the other thing that you'll see is that since the Reformed only view this as a symbol, they don't treat it with respect by substituting other things to it, but also they freely give it to just about anybody that wants to receive it. Whereas the Catholics, again, who have a higher respect for the Lord's Supper, now, again, there are variants, but generally the doctrine of the Lord's Supper in the Catholic Church is closed communion. Non-Catholics, according to the doctrine of the church, should not receive the Lord's Supper at a Catholic altar. Now, there are those extremists that do allow non-Catholics or maybe non-practicing Catholics to receive the Lord's Supper, but that's actually against the doctrine of the church. That's contrary to what they actually believe as a church body. So closed communion is something that we practice because... Christ's body and blood is present because of the danger that is associated with receiving the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Any thoughts? I think you just are not related. You said before that Calvin and the, the next person from Melanchthon, the church, they kind of joined together? Yes. They brought us apart again. Well, so this, mm -hmm. this would have done that because... So if you remember, I don't know if you were here the week that we did the, the introduction to this. So there, it told the story about what happened after Luther's death. So you had the replace. So remember Emperor Fre uh, Elector Frederick, who was the guy who sort of protected Martin Luther. He died, his brother died, his cousin died. And then you get the next generation down. And there was that whole issue where they thought that it was Lutheran because it was crypto. It was hidden. And so... Those guys kind of came together, but then it was through... So the three authors of the Formula of Concord were Jacob Andrea, Martin Chemnitz, and Nicholas Selnecker. And those three pastors, as well as a lot of others, said, hey, we need to straighten this stuff out. We need to lay down what actual Lutheran doctrine is. And that was what really... The Formula of Concord would have been really what separated then the crypto-Calvinists from true Lutheranism. So that's a good question. Yeah. So by 1580, when the Book of Concord was put together after the Formula of Concord had been written and all of those things were put together, there was, there was some solidity in Lutheran doctrine once again. And it wasn't, it wasn't all mixed up like it had been under Philip Melanchthon. Mark? Well, maybe you guys covered in previous weeks, but we're all in this room because of joint fellowship. And we understand the fellowship issue in, in, in church bodies. Um, but when you, when you cross this over with communion, it seems like communion is something that's very visible to people walking into our church these days. So, so you have a child who marries somebody who's not of the faith, but they start attending church. And you'd like to see them join the church. Mm -hmm. uh, just in the last month, I've seen the two cases where somebody has been a member for 30 years and now has left because their spouse says, there's just something wrong with that communion situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a big part of that, and this is one of the reasons why we're actually discussing this in, in Bible class, is because I think that there are a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions when it comes to the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. You know, starting with just that very thing right there, that I think when it comes to the Lord's Supper, there's, there's one thing about understanding this, 
that Christ's body and blood are present uh, and, and they're there with the bread and the wine. But what happens then is somebody says, well, that's what I believe too. And so a lot of times when we teach the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, we only teach it from this perspective as opposed to the, the fellowship perspective. And we, we did talk about that early on when we were going through 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. We talked about the fact that Jesus says, well, Jesus says, take and eat, and he only had his uh, close disciples that were there celebrating the Lord's Supper with him when he instituted it. And then you can look at the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians and dealing with the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and the fact that we are all one bread, one body. You know, he says we all partake, so there's that fellowship aspect. And I think that's an important thing that we often, we often forget to, to, to instruct that in, in the in the starting at a young age with our children and reminding them this is, this is why we do this because this is different from the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. And so part of it is maybe the way that we are presenting it, not as faithfully or, or on the same level that we should, not just dealing with this, but the other aspect as well. Because it's just as important as this aspect of understanding what's going on in the Lord's Supper. I've told the story, and I'll get to you in just a second. I've told the story about the fellow... you got four minutes before church. Oh, okay. Oh. oh, that's what that was. Okay. That's a different, that's, that's a different kind of hand. So, uh, yeah, um, but, but my hope is after Christmas to keep going on and talk a little more about some of those practical aspects of the Lord's Supper, too. All right, let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>